it's a totally different ball game out there and people need advice and they need help. And I really feel like that's a huge underserved market. Same thing with widows, women and men in transition. That's a huge area, huge niche, but it doesn't mean get into it. It means figure out what your niche is and what you want. If you love retirement, focus on retirement. If you love stock options, focus on stock options. If you're interested in helping people in transition, then go for those designations. Welcome to the Active Advisor Podcast, brought to you by Harbor Capital. Join us as we learn from pros who have helped thousands of investors live better lives. I'm Brian Moore, and I'll be chatting with some of the brightest minds in the financial advisory business, bringing you insights on practice management and investment research that works for advisors and their clients. Joining me today on this episode of the Active Advisor Podcast is Nicole Middendorf. Nicole is the CEO of Prosper Wealth Financial out of Minnetonka, Minnesota. As a wealth advisor and certified divorce financial analyst, her main focus is to help people find happiness in life and feel comfortable with their money. She is a money maven, a knowledge junkie, and a born coach. Nicole is an entrepreneur who left Morgan Stanley in 2003 to run her own wealth management firm. She is the author of five books, a world traveler, philanthropist, and an accomplished public speaker. Welcome, Nicole, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. My co-host for this episode is Gavin Ernst, who's a fellow colleague of mine at Harbor Capital and a senior business development analyst. Thanks for joining us, Gavin. Thanks for having me, Brian. Nicole, it's great to see you again, and thank you for joining us on today's edition of the Active Advisor podcast. Nicole, I've got to say that is one of the better intros that I've read. Definitely, the grass does not grow beneath your feet, to use a Southern phrase. Uh, can't wait to dig in and learn more, but first, I have to stick with our tradition, which is uh, the way we kick off each episode which by asking, what is your first memory you have related to money or investing? Relates to the tooth fairy. <laughs> I, I woke up one morning and I had this little tiny pillow that I'd put my tooth in the night before. And in the morning I woke up and uh, there was a $2 bill in there. And I went running down the hallway yelling, I got gypped, I got ripped off. <laughs> and the tooth fairy left me fake money. And I'm like, just upset. And my dad is like, Nikki, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. And he's like, what's going on? Well, I got a $2 bill. I got fake money from the tooth fairy. And he's like, come with me, come with me. And he led me into his bedroom. And on his dresser, he had like this top hidden drawer. And he pulled it out and it was full of $2 bills. And he's like, I collect them. They're real. They're special. And so that was my first, first memory. And so when I had children, I then gave them a $2 bill one of the years as they were growing up to have a similar experience as well. <laughs> That's great. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, yeah. And $2 bills are special. You are 100% right. I tell my kids that and we've got them that for their first tooth as well. Oddly enough. That's great. Before we dig in, I'd like to go a little bit more about you and your business model. You have an unbelievable story of success in the face of overcoming extreme adversity. If you're comfortable with it, could you possibly share the story of resilience and the origin of the Live It list? So I tell people, if you look up the word resilient in the dictionary, my name is right there. And the Live It list came about, I never planned on it being anything big, but it came out of the worst moments of my life. On August 4th of 2010, that was the first time that the 911 phone call went through. And my daughter was six months old. My son was two at the time. And I had to become to the realization and I had to have awareness that I was a victim of domestic violence. And my now ex-husband was my OSJ branch manager. And so one, dealing with domestic violence is difficult, but then you mix money in it and then you mix being working together and having this person as your branch manager was extremely difficult. And so I got the kids to bed one night and I sat down and I'm like, how did I end up here? <laughs> like from the outside, my life looked perfect. Living in a big house, you know, boat, four wheelers, cars. I was doing a radio show. I had written probably, I think one or two books at the time. And so from the outside, you know, life looked amazing. But from the inside, I hated every aspect of it. Nothing I had picked out. The house I didn't pick out, the car, the boats, all of the stuff that we had. And it really meant nothing to me because I wasn't happy. And so I'm like, what am I going to do about this? 
And so I decided, I'm like, I'm going to rewrite my bucket list because I always had lists. I was a former figure skater and I was blessed to have a coach that had her PhD in psychology. With, so she worked with me so much of the power of the mind. And I just was always focused on motivational speakers and I just always had lists. And so I rewrote my bucket list. Well, when you say the term bucket list, people think you're dying. And I, in my opinion, had already died <laughs> inside. And I'm like, everything in my life is so negative. I'm like, I can't tell people I'm doing something on my bucket list. I need to put a positive spin on this. So I just started calling it the live it list. Well, then I learned one in three Americans is happy. I learned if you spend more money in experiences, you're going to be happier than if you spend money on things. And so it was this aha moment for me of, oh my gosh, I never planned on being a wealth advisor, but here's how I can love being a wealth advisor. I loved helping people. And I said, oh my gosh, like, you know, we, we do financial plans for every client. Every client then, yes, we can look at retirement and education planning, but we can ask them what's on their limit list and help put a positive spin on the bucket list and help people be happy and find their happiness. So out of the worst moment in my life actually became one of the best tools that we use. And it's grown into this huge thing that I never, never, ever imagined or expected. That's a great story. And congratulations you know, for being able to turn that into what you've been able to kind of turn it into today. You know, it, it seems to me like, you know, definitely kind of you're really focused on helping others and, and yourself personally living your best life. What made why did you make the decision, I guess, to stay in this industry and to help fill this need to help others as a wealth advisor? I feel like you're the only the second person that has asked me that <laughs> over the years. I never really asked myself that. I never thought it was an option when I was in the middle of the stuff. It comes back to sometimes, you know, other people may see things that we don't necessarily see ourselves. But I, I spoke oh, probably four years ago at the Carlson School of Management, the U of M, and a college student asked me that question. She's like, you had this dream of going to law school. So when all of this stuff happened, like, why didn't you go fulfill your dream? I'm like, I had two kids under the age of two and I was a million dollar producer as an advisor going to receive no child support and having to pay spousal maintenance. I didn't feel like it was an option at all to go and find my dream. And so I felt stuck in this situation and it's like, okay, I got to make the best of it. And you know, I believe things happen for a reason and it makes sense now where it's like, oh my gosh, like I have my own foundation and we now launched the liveitlist.com earlier this year and we take liveitlist trips. It all makes sense now, but I definitely did not see it. I didn't think it was an option. That's great. The Lord works in mysterious ways. Absolutely. Your foundation, you touched on that briefly. Would love to hear a little bit more about that if you wouldn't mind kind of talking about it. Yeah. So when the police came to my house that day, uh, they handed me a card to a domestic abuse shelter. And I became a certified divorce financial analyst in 1999. And I started teaching classes, divorce dollars and cents is what it was called. And, and I would volunteer and teach that class at a lot of these domestic abuse shelters, as well as the women's organizations around town. And so I called them and they're like, hey, Paul, are you calling about when you're coming in next week to volunteer? I'm like, no, I'm actually calling because I'm a client now and need to become a client. And so I was thrown into this world that I knew nothing about. And I made so many mistakes that still affect me and our children to this day. And so I knew nothing. Like I, I'm an only child. I went to private Catholic school. I didn't know what bail was or child protection or order for protection or, you know, any of these things, let alone deal with owning a business with someone else. And how do you make it? How do you survive emotionally, financially, all of these things? And so I committed to myself. I needed to make change. And so I then later on started the foundation. And so what we do is the month of October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so that's when we take nominations and the whole focus, we primarily have been helping women, but we will sure can help men, but one in four uh, women are victims of domestic violence. And so we take nominations and it could be a woman that has gotten out of a situation, but just really hasn't made things happen and is just feeling stuck. Or it's a woman that's in a situation that needs to get out. And what we do is we select them in November and we let them know that they're recipients and we give them a holiday season. And so 
I personally go with my kids and we go shopping and more or less we adopt them for the Christmas, adopt a family. And we are buying bed sheets and clothes and things for these kids that they really just need for survival and giving to them for Christmas that they wouldn't necessarily have. And then we, I do a Zoom with them or meet with them and ask them, what do they need? And so our women this year, it's usually a CPA, an attorney. I give financial advice. A woman this year needed more of a nutrition and a health focus for her and her daughter. And so that's where I go out to the community and ask for help. Attorneys to volunteer, mortgage brokers, realtors, CPAs, therapists, you name it. And we have a Zoom together as a group and say, what are your goals and how can we help you? And then we meet together. So we just all met with our Zooms with our women uh, halfway through the year to say, okay, where were you? What are your goals for the year? What have we done so far? And what do we need to do before the year is over? And so it's these women have a support system and a place for a whole year to help them really get back on their feet, emotionally, financially, uh, you know, psychologically, everything. And then at the end of the year, I take them to the Mall of America with a thousand dollar shopping spree. And then um, we get them to a salon. They get a new haircut, a style, makeup. And so the concept is really to give these women a whole fresh start, but a support system for a whole year to take them from victims to survivors. That's amazing. And thank you on behalf of society. And, uh, you know, it's that is something that I wish, you know, more people would get involved in. And so please, anybody who's listening to this, you know, if you get a chance, I'm sure we'll mention the foundation, you know, how to get involved later. Gavin, I believe you may have a question uh, about business model. Yeah, in my role, Nicole, I work with a lot of advisors and advisor teams. And I don't think I know anyone who's doing things quite like you. You're truly helping your clients achieve not only financial health, but also mental and spiritual wealth, the way that you help folks achieve items on their live list and help folks get out of difficult situations. Can you talk a little bit more about your differentiated approach? It's all about helping people. And so for me, it's, you know, yes, I'm a financial advisor, but I joke so many days that I feel more like a therapist. (laughs) And I don't look at this from like an analytical standpoint. I look at this from a left brain standpoint and a right brain standpoint. And I feel like for us at Prosper Well, we're bringing more of that (laughs) touchy (laughs) feely or that emotions into it. Part of it probably is because I'm a woman (laughs) and we're a woman owned. But, you know, my, I bought this building five years ago and even the concept of the building, I wanted it to feel like you're walking in and you feel like you're going to a professional environment, but like a spa, but like it's comfortable. And so for us, money can be so overwhelming and so intimidating for people. And we don't want people to feel that way. We want people to feel welcome, to feel open, because if they're open to having those conversations, that's where we can help them from a whole holistic standpoint. It's not just, okay, what's your portfolio done? And you know, whatever. I mean, I just had a call with a client and we were going over what they've earned versus the benchmarks and all of that stuff. But that's a portion of the conversation. The bigger portion is her nervousness and her feeling that her kids are getting older and where are the 529 plans at? And so it only, it comes from When I started first as an advisor, there was this man, and he still is working. (laughs) That's just surprising me. But when I would walk down by his office, he had birds in his office. And every time I would walk, he'd always leave the door open. And every time I would walk by, the conversations I heard were never about portfolios. It was like never about their accounts. It was never about alphas and betas (laughs) and all of these things. It was about their kids, their travels, their life, their experiences. And so for me, I look at it that it's all about the relationship. And, you know, we just did a burger tasting the other night. And, you know, we have clients that are going on trips with us. And like that's that, you know, there's a there's a client that I helped her. Um, her husband passed away and I helped her deal with everything. I helped her start her business. She then got married and had a very tiny, tiny wedding. And I was invited. And that was one of the most difficult situations to be at because you're aware of confidentiality. <laughs> You know, people were like, how do you know her? How do you know him? And I'm like, we're friends, we're friends. She obviously was then very vocal. Like, this is my financial advisor. But I'm like, here I am, a financial advisor being invited to this tiny wedding. Like, I don't know. That's that special experience that we want people to have. We want, we call it the wow experience. We want our clients to say wow. That's awesome. 
Having uh, visited your office in Minnetonka, I can personally attest that your office definitely feels like a trip to the spa. (laughs) But I was also curious to hear from you, how does the investment management and portfolio construction aspect of the relationship tie into the holistic picture of what you deliver to your clients? So Raymond James is our broker dealer. So we rely on them. Eventually, the goal is that we have our own chief investment officer. We're not there yet, but we have a Prosper Well investment team that we meet and we'll make decisions. And we're always looking at all different types of research. But it's really important to me that we have this balance of not having a cookie cutter approach and having things customized, but also not having so that it's not not manageable for us in our practice. And so eventually that's where the goal is to have a chief investment officer I would love later on to have my own portfolios as well, but we're, you know, that's stuff in the future. <laughs> we're not there yet. No, that's great. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with relying on you know, a little home office help until you kind of, you know, get comfortable and up and, up and running. If we could, I'd love to circle back. I know you mentioned a little bit earlier, you had this CDFA uh, certification. Do you believe that this is a differentiator for your practice? Or do you think more advisors should have it? Absolutely. It's what made me different. It's what made me unique. I mean, yes, being a female in the financial services industry, I'm unique and different from that standpoint. But it's what really helped launch me being on TV and radio. Because one of the things that I've learned is reporters are always looking for something to talk about. And so if you can come from something at a different angle. So for me, you know, in, in 99, I was there was myself and then another woman who has since retired. We were the first certified divorce financial analysts in Minnesota. And we kind of did it about the same time. And so that's where it was unique and different. And so what makes you unique? What makes you different? You know, why should a client invest with you versus, you know, the three other financial advisors that they're interviewing and looking at? And so for me, it wasn't something that I planned on. I never planned on focusing on divorce. My ex-husband is actually the one that signed me up for the course. I was raised private Catholic, really didn't believe in divorce. But for me, it's something that made me unique and different. And now as we've grown and continue to grow, my focus is to bring on another advisor that really takes more of the divorce cases I can only handle so much. And so I really feel like it's a a niche that, you know, I I right now, unfortunately, see the divorce rate dramatically going up. And so there's so many people, you know, when I first started with the CDFA, attorneys were really hesitant to use us, where now it's, well, who's your CDFA? (laughs) Who's your financial person that's helping you figure this stuff out? And so it's a totally different ballgame out there and people need advice. And they need help. And I really feel like that's a huge underserved market. Same thing with with widows. You know, women and men in transition, that's a huge, huge area, huge niche. But it doesn't mean get into it. It means figure out what your niche is and what you want. Like if you love retirement, focus on retirement. If you love stock options, focus on stock options. If you're interested in helping people in transition, then go for those designations. Gotcha. No, that makes perfect sense. You've mentioned a couple of times like being different and diversity. Can you talk a little bit more about your passion for growing diversity and inclusion in the financial services industry? I would love to add more diversity (laughs) to to the financial services industry. And I feel like that's another hat that I wear. And I feel like it's an initiative that I want to make some personal change as we grow as a firm, not just for us internally, but within the whole industry. I was on a Zoom with the other top women advisors And all of us were like, why are we struggling so much to get that next person into the office? And I mean, we're experiencing it. Before the year is over, we want to hire two more relationship managers. And we have recruiters that send me resumes and I have not received a single female resume. And so the question on the Zoom was, why? Like, why do we not have more women? And so all of us shared our story and all of us had one thing in common. None of us planned to be wealth advisors. And so we all decided like, we need to share our story and we need to tell and explain to the world and to women that there's a financial services, there's a place for women in financial services. And it's a phenomenal career if you could get into it. But looking back, like 
you know, I waited to have children, like all the decisions that I made, most people can't do that. It's very difficult. And so it's finding that right team. It's finding that right person to be that mentor. And it's also making sure that there's awareness out there because we definitely do need diversity in our industry because you need diverse opinions. You're going to be a better unit and a better team the more diverse you are. Completely agree. Completely agree. It's really inspiring to hear how you've been helping women and underserved investors achieve their goals, Nicole. I noticed on one of your LinkedIn updates that you won the 2022 award for Woman Business Owner of the Year from the National Association of Women Business Owners. Congrats on that achievement amongst many. I've enjoyed seeing your LinkedIn updates with content that goes beyond financial updates. In fact, I think I saw one of them earlier this week, Nicole, that uh, had a great life tip about writing down three ways that you made progress for the day and three things that you're grateful for. And I've heard you mention that you believe marketing is at the core of your business and your growth. And I would love to hear more about how you leverage LinkedIn as part of your marketing strategy, as well as any other tips that you might have for advisors looking to grow their business with marketing. So I was at a conference probably five years ago now, and uh, a man, uh, Kevin Knebel, who is a consultant on LinkedIn, he was speaking and I went up to him afterwards and his whole talk was, you know, this advisor at Merrill Lynch got a, you know, $17 million account and this advisor got a four. And I'm like, why am I not getting these? <laughs> and so I walked up to him afterwards. I'm like, here's my card and I need to hire you. <laughs> so we did a consultation and he's like, you don't need to hire me. He's like, you just need to do these nine things. And I'm like, okay. And so I think I had like 3,000 followers <laughs> at the time. And I now am at 25,000, 26,000. And I just wow. followed his nine things. And really, it, it linked in. It helped me find my voice. And it helped me really be truly authentic and take my life experience and share that. And people are attracted to authenticity. And people want... I mean, generally, our clients are a lot like me. <laughs> They're they're type A, they're drivers, they have a lot of business owners, there are people that are workaholics, recovering perfectionists, <laughs> go-getters, people that love to travel, people that love to work out, people that are parents. And so that's what I write about is my real life. And it's all about helping people and inspiring people. And if I can, I, we always track like, you know, what's a popular post or not. And one of the posts that stands out that was a bigger hit recently I was taking my son down to Miami to a football game and uh, we got on the plane and I was the middle, my son was the aisle and the woman wasn't there yet or man that wasn't there yet for the window seat. So we sit down and this woman comes up and she was obviously there to sit in that seat. My son pops up and he says, ma'am, would you like me to help lift your bag up? And she's like, yes. And so he takes her bag, puts it up there and sits down. And I make eye contact a little bit later with the flight attendant. And this flight attendant was like, you prompt him? I'm like, no. <laughs> and so the flight attendant, he comes over and he's like, sir, to my son, who was 14. He's like, sir, I see hundreds of men a day. And he goes, very rarely do I see a man help a woman lift her bag up above. So please keep doing what you're doing. And Thank you to your mother for raising a kid that's so kind. And so it was one of those moments where I was like, oh my God. Like, and so I texted my mom and dad, you know, a few of my friends. And, and then I was like, here's a moment that I can share as a story that just can hopefully help inspire someone else to pick up someone's bag the next time they're on a plane and assist someone or, you know, whatever it is, any kind of random act of kindness. And so it, that's what it's all about. That's just, me as a person, I want to help people. And so LinkedIn for me has become a way to help others and get the word out. And so that's where I've had to really learn like, okay, I need to add a sentence like, by the way, by the way I'm a wealth advisor, <laughs> not just like a motivational speaker <laughs> or an inspirational speaker. And so I've had to learn now, like, I feel like I swung, you know, in anything, you don't want to like swing one pendulum too far, but like, I'm like, okay, now I need to make sure that I'm making sure people are aware that I'm a wealth advisor. But for LinkedIn, I know there's tons of advisors that have, you know, three meetings and all this stuff. 
people come into the office or they'll just call and like, they don't even talk to me. They'll talk to a relationship manager and open up an account and do a 401k plan rollover. And here they are as clients. What LinkedIn has done is it's allowed people to understand our philosophy, our culture, who we are as people, and they really hear our authentic voice. And so it's LinkedIn's been just phenomenal for us. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. No, that is great. I have a quick question on the topic. In a previous employer, we had the privilege of working with a professor from MIT who did a lot of research and advisors and how women are really, I guess, a group as a whole that financial advisors, at least in the in the males, probably more so than the women, haven't really focused on. And it's one of those things, I think there's research out there that, you know, men typically will pass before women. And if you don't go out and reach out to women, that's chances are you may lose that account. Is that something that you, I know you mentioned earlier, you know, top successful women kind of financial advisors. Is that something that seems to me to, that the women seem to be a, a much underserved kind of, I guess, audience in America financially? It is. I was just talking to one of our senior wealth advisors about this yesterday because we just did an event with some clients and a woman was talking to me about how, you know, her concern is when her husband passes. And she's like, I'm going to call you. But she's like, but what else? Like what, you know, and I'm like, gosh, like we need to even like step up our game more with that and with widows. And, but what I had this aha moment is, so they have two other advisors, but really they hired me for their daughter because they actually, and I just talked to her today, they gifted more money out of their trust to her. And so that's where, and I was talking to this, our advisor about this of like, that's what makes us so unique is one, I'm a woman, but two, there are people that come to us to hire us on to take care of their wife or they hire us on to take care of their kids. And to me, that's so powerful. So one, if you look at like my book, our book is not full of people in their 80s. (laughs) You know, we have a young, you know, if you take my book and compare it to my peers, we have a younger book, but we also go so deep in the relationships. Like my focus is, you know, I don't want to be, we, unfortunately, for some reason, I've gained a lot of widows recently and they're coming from male advisors. And so, you know, for me, it's all about how do you solidify that relationship and how do you, and they're, how do you help people? And I mean, you can go and hear professors speak and see all these studies, you know, like when you're in an appointment, you need to look at the woman two times more than you look at the man. (laughs) And, you know, the pictures, like I have pictures all throughout my office and it's of my kids and people want to know you. They want to know that connection. They want that relationship. No, agreed. I think that's one of the areas that my personal, you know, belief is that that exactly. You're as an advisor, you really need do need to focus on the women and the wives and and even the kids because, you know, when the husband, God forbid, passes away, if the daughter has a different advisor, then that's something that money usually kind of flows away. And so that's great that people are entrusting you while they're still alive with their wives and and kids' money. That says a lot, in my opinion. Well, I have one last question for you. I know we've kept you here a little bit and I apologize, but it's been extremely entertaining and insightful on my part. We at Harbor believe wholeheartedly in active management, and it's actually the inspiration behind the name of this podcast, The Active Advisor. But active management means something different to everyone. What is your philosophy when it comes to active management? For me, it's being on top of it, being proactive. You know, we as women, we tend to care more. I don't want how I talk to clients is I I tell them I don't want to lose sleep at night and women overall tend to be more conservative. And so if anything right now, it's hurt us because we've had so much money in CDs and so much money in cash. But we did that from a standpoint of I don't want to lose money for people. I would rather err on the conservative side. And I'm not saying that we pulled everything out, but I'm just saying that we've been but much more cautious. And so to me, active management is not spending time on the golf course (laughs) and not spending, not now, don't get me wrong. I'm in a golf league. (laughs) I, I try to get out there once a week if I'm lucky, but it's being proactive and it's calling your clients before they call you. And it's analyzing your portfolios and being a good steer. Your clients are giving you 
their hard-earned money to be a good steward of it. And so it's to be a good steward of that money and to do your due diligence. And it's interesting because clients will ask like, well, why do you like this manager or what, you know, and over the years, we've made some decisions where it's like, gosh, this isn't my favorite anymore. And I'm very open and honest and frank with why and the decisions that we're making. And so you want to be thoughtful and be very proactive and share your reasonings and be very honest and open with your clients. Well, that is very sound advice. And the world would take heed to listen to it for certain. Thank you so much for taking the time today. How can people find you? What's your, I know you mentioned LinkedIn, what's your firm's website and do you have any social, I guess I'm, this is, yeah, you know, this is where my daughter makes fun of you, any social. Do you have any, I guess your firm on Twitter? Yep. <laughs> We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. You can you can go to prosperwell.com. There's then NicoleMiddendorf.com. That's where we have the producers club as well. Cause I always get asked, you know, okay, you went from 75,000 in production when within five years of your million dollar producer, how did you do it? And so we launched the producers club there to help people with that. And then we launched the liveitlist.com earlier this year. So that's great. Well, everybody can find you there and I highly encourage them to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Let me know when you're ready for the 60 seconds. I'm ready. Here we go. Nickname. Nick. Nicky or Nickster. Hobby. Boxing. Favorite podcast. Mine. Most recent thing you've checked off your livid list. Burger tasting. Most recent addition to your livid list. Hidden Lake Trail in Montana. Profession if you weren't an advisor or public speaker. An attorney. Messy desk or clean desk. Pretty messy. Piece of advice that applies to almost any client imaginable. Give yourself grace. Favorite quote. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Favorite Minnesota sports team? It's the Vikings. Most used emoji in text messaging? Smile face. Favorite lake in Minnesota? Lake Minnetonka. Mountains or beach? Beach. More important for advisors to be good listeners or good investors? Good listeners. Women in finance that you admire? Jean Chotsky. Hidden talent? Figure skater. 60-40 portfolio, a classic or a relic? Classic. Favorite way to get active? Being outside. Whether you're a seasoned advisor or just getting started, The Active Advisor brought to you by Harbor Capital offers professional insights for the financial advisor community. Visit us at harborcapital.com to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe to The Active Advisor on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date on investment trends, tried and tested research methods, and what your industry peers are up to. From all of us at Harbor Capital, thanks for tuning in. And now for important disclosures, this material is for informational purposes and is not intended to be relied upon as a forecast, research or investment advice and is not a recommendation, offer or solicitation to buy or sell any securities or adopt any investment strategy. The opinions expressed are as of 28th of July 2023 and are subject to change. The opinions expressed by the speakers do not necessarily represent the views of Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. The information and opinions contained in this material are derived from proprietary and non-proprietary sources deemed by Harbour Capital Advisors, Inc. to be reliable and are not necessarily all-inclusive and are not guaranteed as to accuracy. This material may contain forward-looking information that is not purely historical in nature. Such information may include, among other things, projections and forecasts. There is no guarantee that any of these views will come to pass. This material may not be representative of the experience of other individuals. Reliance upon information in this material is at the sole discretion of the viewer. This material is not legal, tax or accounting advice. Please consult with a qualified professional for this type of advice. Investing involves risk including the risk of loss. Stock markets are volatile and equity values can decline significantly in response to adverse issuer, political, regulatory, market and economic conditions. Fixed income investments are affected by interest rate changes and the creditworthiness of issuers. As interest rates rise, the values of fixed income securities are likely to decrease. Specific companies and issuers are mentioned for educational purposes only and should not be deemed a recommendation to buy or sell any securities. 
any companies mentioned do not necessarily represent current or future holdings of any investment products. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. does and may seek to do business with companies covered in this podcast. As a result, listeners should be aware that the firm may have a conflict of interest that could affect the objectivity of this podcast. This material is prepared by Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. is not affiliated with Prosper Well Financial. All trademarks or product names mentioned herein are the property of their respective owners. Copyright 2023 Harbour Capital Advisors Inc. All rights reserved.